what we need to do. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the wherewithal to do what we need to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Soteriology is derived from two Greek words. Okay, the first part is soteria. That's uh, a little bit more complicated if you're studying Greek, you know. Because logos, everyone knows what logos is. What is logos? Word. Logos is word. And soteria means salvation. So that's why soteriology, soteria and logos are the etymology, the word basis that came from Greek. Okay. Soteria is Greek for salvation. And Logos is for the word. No, no, no. What, what page are you reading? Page 150. First, first page. So, so you guys might have a different... Uh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, first page. Oh, first page. First page of chapter 5. Oh, okay. Start with chapter 5. Mm -hmm. 179. 179 on ours. Yeah. Okay, so now you have a point of view. Okay, 179. Yeah. Alright, so... Let's go through quickly. My page 184, I guess your page should be 180, right? Provisions that have been made, no, that's not 180. Oh yeah, I think it's 180. Right? Provisions that have been made. Okay, that's a view. The death of Christ. Why? Because if Christ did not die, then we are still in our sins. Right? If Christ did not die, we have a problem. Next. The importance of the death of Christ. Christ died for our sins. It's in 1 Corinthians 5 3. Now Christianity, can I read for you that uh, next, the top of the, uh, what is that, 181? Mm -hmm. Okay, top, the first paragraph. Christianity, Christianity is like, unlike all other religions, in the place it assigns to the death of its founder. All other religions base their claim to greatness on the life and teaching of those who found them. But the gospel of Jesus Christ centers around the person of Jesus Christ, including especially his death at Calvary. It has often been said there is good in every religion. It may be true that there is some ethical value in many other teachings, but only in Christianity do we have redemption from sin. Okay? So, without that redemption from sin, you do not have well, this is a waste of time. You know, to come here for three hours, listen to somebody teach you, read your Bible, and then, you know what, what's the next thing we're going to do? Monday, Tuesday, we go to Bible school. Wednesday, we go to prayer meeting. And then uh, Thursday, you go to discipleship or bridges. Saturday, you go to men's meeting. Sunday, you go to the services. And that's all garbage. If Jesus did not die for our sins, there is no substitutionary sacrifice, then all those things that we are trying to do are useless. They're of no value. Imagine that. See, so we took that time. Huh? So I wanted to read that in the, that way you can uh, uh, go and understand the real heaviness of what that is. If we cannot grasp the concept of Christ dying for our sins, then we cannot grasp the value of anything that we do. It doesn't matter what you do in the context of ministry, in the context of church, in the context of service. If you teach, if you preach, if you sweep the floors, if you wash the dishes, if you give your tithes. You imagine if Jesus did not die on the cross, there is no forgiveness of sin. Therefore, you don't need to confess your sin. Every time you confess, it's a hollow exercise. You imagine that? See, that's a disaster, right? Now, any other concept that is part of the teaching that happens in world religions, all the other concepts teach about the, um, how do you say, the intellectual pro prowess or the ethical strength of a man. Buddhist teachings, Muhammad's teachings, uh, Confucius teachings, whoever else that you pick. And most of these teachings, even the whole teachings, you know, 
if you read everything that uh, Jim Jones or David Koresh said, these are you know, our classic cult leaders, there is an element of ethical value. They were ethical to a certain extent. But, right, but, see, unless there is the empowerment that comes from the forgiveness of sin. You know why there's no empowerment and the forgiveness of sin for those people, for cults? Why? Anyone tell me? Because they are just simple men. Okay. Just no, but yes, yes, they are simple men. But what did they do? No, what, what was the question again? Why there is no empowerment? Why there is no empowerment? They teaching. They are simple men. They are not the son of God. And they didn't shed their blood. And all that. Right. But they claim, who do they claim to be? Messiah. They claim to be Messiah. Okay. That, that they, <laughs> they claim to be the substitution and the sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And because they claim that and they're not, then what happens? No redemption. There you go. Powerless, dead, deceived. Okay, so that's the bad part about that. They claim to be the one that is capable of doing what God had to do for man. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now, there is an emptiness in that whole concept. See? You can follow everything that is in scripture, but when you get to the point and say that Jesus is not good. Yeah. This, this thing that we do, as much as I teach, as, as good as the books are, as, as the foundations are set, if I decide on my part okay, to say, well, you know what? I can save you. The truth of the matter is I cannot deliver and then everything goes into shambles. Right? Uh, 190 in your book, 194 in mine. Uh, we're talking about the sea, redemption. We're going into this. We took up uh, propitiation, right? We talked about that. My book page 192, 193, propitiation. Now let's talk about, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, Ransom and Redemption. Do you have that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, letter E, Ransom and Redemption. What page now? Let me see. Do my best. Oh, you. Lagi kan, lagi kan, ano? Lagi kan, negative 4. So you're 190. 190. Do you see it? Letter E? Okay. Letter E, yeah. Letter E. Let's wait for that. One ninety, I think. One ninety, you see it? Yeah. It is ransom or redemption. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. But the word redemption signifies. You're all there, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The word redemption signifies a releasing of liberation from captivity, slavery, or debt by payment of a price called a ransom. Okay. This is not a release. Okay. When we are released, when we're talking about this concept of release and redemption. First redemption. Redemption is what? What can you say? If I say you can redeem this, what does that mean? Give back. Okay, for example, if I give you a piece of paper and I say go to the bank, you can redeem that for money. I give you a cashier's check. This cashier's check, when you take to the bank, you can redeem that for money. Okay. A piece of paper becomes money. Okay? In human terms, when we talk about redemption, I give you something that's not really that valuable but it represents or it holds information that is valuable to you. Okay? For example, if you say a redemption price, what's that? You went and you collected, let's say, bottle caps of, uh, you know, a drink, or you went to McDonald's and you went to the Monopoly stops and it says redeem this for $5,000. It is something that is worthless, but there's information there. And that's something that is worthless. If you redeem it, becomes worth something. You buy a lottery ticket for the lotto, you win. You win 50 million. That piece of paper is not worth 50 million. Right? You can hold it for 2 million years. That, 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 that lotto ticket will just be a piece of paper. It could become 200 years old. It's not going to be 50 million. There are, there are documents that have the name of George Washington from his
this campaign and they buy it for thousands of dollars. But it's not going to be 50 million. But a lottery ticket is not a valuable thing. Its value is not 50 million dollars. Okay? A lottery ticket is not 50 million dollars. But if you redeem the lottery ticket, its value ratchets up. Now, that's human terms, human definitions of redemption, right? God's redemption, on the other hand, involves the concept of ransom. Right? Ransom or redemption. Why? Right? What is a ransom? The price to be paid. Price. Or, when do you normally pay a ransom? Captivity. What about what? Captivity. Yeah. Captivity or kidnapping? Okay. If you're under captivity or kidnapping, I'm the kidnapper, I took your child, give me two million tonight, I'll release the child to you. That's a ransom. Right? Now, that's more accurate for me when you talk about society because a ransom is something of value, right? You build up amounts, that's your ransom money, and then you redeem something that is more valuable to you than your ransom, right? Let's say, for example, let's, let's, let's see this. Let's say I'm a parent, they kidnapped my son, they said, we'll take your life, we'll release your son. To me, the life of my son is more valuable than mine, right? At that point, I said, okay, I'm the ransom. Right. Let's say I'm dating this girl, I've dated her for two weeks, somebody kidnapped her and said, hey, you know what, you need to pay five million, or otherwise, okay, otherwise, we will kill her. <laughs> now, you knowing my character, what do you think I will say? Yeah? I'm going to call the police. And if she is part of this, I hope you all rot in hell. You all deserve each other. Cheers, five dollars. Okay? Thank you for your time for conversing with me and amusing me. We all are ready. There you go, exactly. He helped you well enough. I'm dating you for two weeks and then all that somebody can touch you. They're asking, and of course I don't have five million. But if I had five million, you know, what I'm gonna say is hey, I need more time. Then I'm gonna call the police. Next time we talk, I'll say you can keep her. <laughs> Five million? Are you kidding me? There is no way. I'm laughing, but when it came to God redeeming us, He gave something more valuable than anything that we have. And uh, what can you say? I'm looking for a technical term. Sorry. And the. I'm going to use mold, but I'm going to get that word. The mold of redemption that he's using, okay, is infinitely more valuable than any of us. You cannot tell me, not one of you can tell me that you are more valuable than God. Based on my values and my judgment, if it was up to me, I would not give God to die for your sins. Especially such a loving pastor, oh, give me a break. Mm -hmm. you know? This God is the basis of my existence, and then you want me? If I were to make the decision, I wish I am not, okay? But just for the sake of conversation, if I was making that decision, I'm not going to tell Jesus to go sacrifice himself for anyone. Not even me. Okay? But God decides that's exactly what we're going to do. That's why I like the fact that when we are taught about redemption, we are taught also about the ransom. We are being ransomed. People who have, or creatures who have, or entities who are of little value compared to what is going to be given. Yeah. Because anyone who is ransomed, like if you kidnap, somebody asks for, let's say, you know, millionaire, the daughter. What's the value of the daughter? Here, I'm going to talk in, in, in a crude uh, illustration, but if she's a prostitute, how much will she be? If you take her organs, how much is she worth? You know? What? If she's a supermodel, how much will she make? It's not going to be as much as the money that's going to be paid in the millions of dollars. 
But that's the human concept, that's a human way of looking at things. Now, with God, here's the difference. God so loves us that the value, it, again, we're not talking about God ransoming us, getting gold and paying for you. No. God gave his son. Gave his son for ransom. Hmm? Now that is a ransom. That is a ransom. And again, releasing or liberation from captivity, slavery, or death by payment of a price. That is a ransom. So to me it's more it's more practical in the English word to say God ransom you. Right? Even as the Son of Man came to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give life. A ransom for many. Matthew twenty, verse twenty. Okay. Now, according to the New Testament, we have redemption from the following, from the penalty of the law. What is the law? What is the curse of the law? You all know about this, but what is it? What is the curse of the law? Nobody can follow the law. You are hanging on the Nobody can okay. follow the law. If it was there, I will tell you it is read your book. But you know, what is the curse of the law? Everyone you guys talk about this, right? Yeah? Christ has yeah. redeemed us. Everyone or everyone who sins unrighteous should die. <laughs> sin should die. Okay, why? What's that? What's the law? You just told me sin. You just told me if you sin you die, okay? But what's the law? What's that have to do with me? Uh, you meet me and go, I'm, I'm a decent man, right? I don't curse, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs, I'm married to one wife. I pay my tithes, I pay my taxes. What is this talk about? I'm subject to the law. I, I follow the laws. There's no attorney there that's charging me. I have no misdemeanors, so how can you talk to me about the law? What is the law? Because one, it's actually number one, from the penalty of the law. Number two, from the law itself. Okay, let's talk about the penalty of the law. What is the penalty of the law? You one already mentioned that. If you sin, you yeah. die. That is the penalty of the law. You agree? Do you agree? Maybe. Huh? Are we sure? I, 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 don't, I only hear one person. When you sin, you die. Therefore, death is the penalty of the law. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. All right. So, the penalty of the law, we are spared from that because of the ransom or redemption of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the law itself? That's why you have to define it. I know you're going to say, oh, we are now under grace. That's what's in your book. We are now under grace. So, the law does not apply to us. Thank you. Okay, that's what the book says. But what is the law? Somebody give me a definition of the law. A set of rules and tradition to to uh, to gain enlightenment and have values. Okay. Nice definition. What is the biblical law? Ten commandments. And okay. All of the other like all right. So why do we need deliverance from the law? Here's where we are. When you read the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament and the Old Testament only, it's called the Chumash, right? That is the Talmud. You know what the Talmud is, right? That's the Book of Law. But sometimes, some people have added their own uh, ideas about the Book of Law, the Talmud. The Chumash is the record of the Old Testament. Old Testament writings. If you read the Chumash, if you read that book, you will read about Old Testament theology. There will be no Jesus Christ. If you do not have Jesus Christ, if you do not have the Old Testament, the only way for you to be saved is to sacrifice, to uh, drain the blood, okay, and have the blood be a covering for sins. But, you know, that does not forgive, that just covers. That's why 
Old Testament people are guilty people. They feel guilty. They may... The, the sins are not forgiven. It's just covered by the blood. Okay? That's why we need Jesus Christ. The problem with the concept of just reading the Old Testament is the more you read the Old Testament, the more you know that you are in trouble. Take Jesus out of the equation of Scripture, and what you have read is a book that condemns you to die. Because who of you have been able to follow the Word? Oh, well, it's, I'll, men, men, it's easy. Just looking around and you know, looking at gorgeous women. Have you not thought in your thoughts? And you also, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is, as one said, when there is sin, that follows. Right? That's why we did that question. The penalty of the law is death. And so we need to be delivered from the law. And the law's deliverance is Jesus. That's why, if you read the Old Testament on its own, it's a death trap. Okay? But if you go ahead and put Jesus in that equation, what happens? Then you overcome sin. Then you overcome life. Okay? From hopelessness to hopefulness to faithfulness. Yeah? First, you have no hope, then you find hope, and then you find your faith. Alright? Number three, from sin as a power in one's life, there are the other things. See? This, this, this thing it distills this whole point. Not only is sin forgiven, and the reason that sin needs to be forgiven is because sin is a power in our life. What is it that you love? Sex, drugs, money, power, whatever it is. For example, if I love money and I'm pastoring here, you know, do you know how easy it is, really, the truth, to make money on the side as a pastor? Do you know how easy it is? Meaning, I don't even have to do anything legal. For example, I have a pastoring and non-profit organization. Instead of doing the work of God, I'll, I'll go and look around and find contacts to solicit for my non-profit. And you know what a non-profit can do, right? It can pay people. I can now be the employee of my non-profit and make money. That can be done. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If you do that every day, if you do it, you know, and that's what you do, and couple it with the videos that I'm in and the church that I serve in, well, there you go. That's how you can make money. But if I do what I do for the love of money, you know, then that, that part of my life, that's sin. As we know, love of money is sin, right? Not because you have money in your pocket, you're sinful. But if I love money more than ministry, mm -hmm. if I would rather not do anything at church, and then use, use my, uh, well, well, everything I have, my, my convincing power, my recruiting power, do that. For example, if, I want new members in church because of the fact that we don't have enough money to pay for our bills. You know, how pure is the motive if you decide, if, we, if, if I run that way, if I run, say as an example, I did a big production, we have a TV channel station now and we need this money. And so now when I go and see other people and they're wanting to come to church, the first thing I think of is, will they give money? Will they support our ministry? And that could be for a pastor a love of money. Why? Because if there's no money in the in the coffers of the church, then you have no support, right? So it's very easy to fall through that. That's the place low. But nowadays, because of how God has blessed us, and I believe because of you know faithfulness, not just of myself, but a lot of people. Nowadays I can honestly say, you want to come to school, it wasn't about the money. You want to come to church, become a member, it's not about the money. It's about doing what is right. And so, when this power is no longer significant in one's life, for example, now that God has given stability, I can now include minister and say, yes, because you are here, because we need to minister to you, we need to spend more. We need to put out something from the treasury which would otherwise stay there. But I'm able to do that now because of the fact that God, I know, gave that money for a purpose. Now, if I love money, I will just keep holding the money for the sake of job security. 
you know, be that password that preaches in the morning in the night room. Be okay. Yeah. So, because there is this ransom, because there is this redemption, the power of sin now is diminished in our lives. You see the statement here, it doesn't say that the power of sin is no longer there. Okay? The power of sin is now diminished in our lives. Okay? Number four, from Satan. 2 Timothy 2.26, same page. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, and through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who fear of who through fear of death were at their all their lifetime subject to bondage. Who of you were ever scared of death? Or still scared of death? I was before. I was before. See, it's different, right? It's different. Remember, you were scared to die? I look at my son and I get scared to die. And then I sort of recover and say, well, you know what? God can take care of your son. Because yeah, my son's a 13-year-old. I'm not afraid if I die that my wife will be forever, you know, uh, uh, miserable. I don't feel that way. I'm not afraid to die and leave my wife. I'm not afraid to die and leave my parents. I'm not afraid to die and leave the church. I'm not afraid to die and leave Yuki, you know, Leva. Mm -hmm. One fear is my son, because I have a 13-year-old son. And I'm going, what if someone picks on him? Who will be there? But I keep thinking, I don't protect my son 24 hours a day. I have to learn to give it to God. And say that has power. But again, let me let me moderate, okay? Some of us, we have the tendency to say, it is Satan that does these things. That's why it happens in our lives. Bad things happen because of Satan. You know what? You know, in church, there's an 80-20 principle. 80% are just hangers on. I've learned that all these years. 80% of your members are really not useful in ministry. They are there to sit, to partake, you know, to receive. I hope not to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> you know? But they are there and they're useless. They have reached their purpose. I pray every day that God will scare them. Not from their purpose, but from death. You know, when you fulfill your purpose, you're supposed to die, right? You believe that? When your purpose in life is done, God will take you. If you're not going to change, that's it. Yeah. So there's 80% who are like that, and 20% who do the ministry, who do the work. And then there's this 20% who are takers. These takers, that's all they do is take. Might be built like bodybuilders, but they're fat slobs, literally. Fat cats. And some people say, yeah, it's because Satan does this and Satan does that. No, sometimes because it's really these people who do it. So I like to moderate that. Say, yes, Satan does control the world. Satan does. You know, Satan has influence on people. That's why some of you, you get attacked. That's why you have to steal yourself and say, oh, no, I need to go and do this. I need to go and finish this. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes going to school is miserable. Mm -hmm. But you need to do it. And the reason you're doing it is because of the fact that God has redeemed you already. You need to act in a manner that is higher than the stimuli, okay? or stimulus. You're not being stimulated because of Satan's attacks. I hope that's not the case. But you're rising above it. Okay? Number five, from evil, including our present mortal body. That is our problem. We have our bodies. We are subjected to evil. We make evil decisions. I, I want to use the word evil now because you're Bible students. You know, sometimes some people will sugarcoat that and say bad decisions, uh, bad actions. But really, we are capable of evil. We are. For example, I have to, every time I work in an office, somebody else's office, I have to really stop myself. Because I have this nasty habit. I'm a closet. I like things in my pocket. I like, I put my tissue there. I put my cell phone there, I put my phone there, my wallet there. And then 
if I want lotion, if I want to put the lotion there, you know, little bottles, not the big bottles, of course. Yeah. And whatever it is that else that I can find, I would like to put in my pockets. I'm a closet. You know, you have pockets inside your suit, pockets outside, pockets in your shirt. And it's just force of habit. And sometimes, with the job in Tales UK, as you say, you put a scissor in your pocket, you know. But one thing that I always put in my pocket, pens. Yeah. And most offices, when you go to the supply room, there's 18 boxes of pens. Red, blue, okay. And then something else, perhaps green. They have different colored pens. My problem is, on certain days, I would walk out of the office, time of it's 5 o'clock, and your, your pen, the pen, the company pen, it's a ball pen, not a expensive pen, but it's in your pocket. And the reason that we have that tendency is because we have the tendency to do evil. It's, you cannot tell me that taking that ball pen is nothing, because it's not yours. See? If I were pure, I would be vigilant in watching when the pens, this, which is not an issue to my employer and not an issue to me, because sometimes I take it back. But sometimes they forget. Don't you get to the house and you take out the pen and you put it in there? Right? And then you go to sleep. Then a month later, you, you, you have your vacation or you have a day off, you come to your desk and there's 18 pens there. You're a kleptomaniac, you just don't know it. <laughs> and the worst part, before I have thought about getting the box to it, putting the pens back in, you know, sell the pens. <laughs> what the heck's wrong with me? It's because there is this evil thing. Uh, may I say that? There's something wrong with me because I keep thinking about the evil stuff. We think about doing the good stuff, but we act on the evil stuff. It is the wrong word probably not being able to say you have something you need to work on. True. So, because we have this mortal body, we have a problem with evil. Okay? That's why I welcome the fact that when God comes, my body will no longer be subject to the forces of evil. I will have a perfect body. I will not need drugs. I will not need alcohol. I won't even need water. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. as far as I've heard, there's still food and water and drink in heaven, but you only do it for the experience, not so that you can feel filled or to drown your sorrow, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not like that. Right? Let's close to this point. Number four. Those for whom Christ died. Doctrine of salvation. It's a very vital question because of the many top theories held within the Christian Church. The Calvinistic theory of a limited atonement teaches that Christ died only for the elect. Okay? That's Calvinistic. I don't believe that. The source prayer does not believe that. If you believe that, please do not teach that in class. Okay? Because we don't we don't believe in that. Right? Whom he had previously chosen. Let us see what the Bible says. For the church, there is no doubt that the church died, that Christ died for the believers or the members of his body and the church. Okay? B for the entire world. And when you say an elect, it's a group of people, right? Mm -hmm. Christ died for the elect. Like election, who, who is the, the group we're talking about when it comes to election? Hmm? Who do you elect? The saints. No, 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 no. Who do you elect? You, you, you elect who? You're not a cardinal. Well, no. officers. Okay, but well, who do you elect? When you vote? President. Oh, president? Who? Governors. Governors, senators, mayors. Okay, that's why that word election, mm -hmm. you are taking them and making them part of a group. This one, this time, a ruling group, right? There's an election. What do you do? You vote. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why they are chosen, elect to choose. Right. And in Calvinism, it says that God chose a certain group of people. But the Bible talks about, again, this is the background term, and that's why the Bible talks about the group of people that God, that Christ died for. One, the church. Okay? There's your verses right there. Read those verses. My page number 195, your page 191, I think. Ephesians 5, John 10. Take note of those. Read that, huh? That's what I said. The, the, the Christ died for those believers. Yeah, but that is one, one aspect. That is one aspect. Next, for the entire world. Okay? Look at B. Christ did not just die for the saints. Okay? May I, Bobby? May I debate you? Oh, 
Okay. Christ died even for those who are yeah. going to hell. Sure. Yeah. It's their choice not to accept Christ. Right. Right. Yeah. right? Do you agree with that? Yeah. Even that person that went to hell, that person, Christ died for. Yeah, because yeah. it's our choice. Right. It's not a question of, hey, hey you know what, I, 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 I died for you, but well, no way. Are you kidding me? No. Huh? Yeah. He died for all. Yeah. So he died for all. Okay. Now, uh, second paragraph, the next page. The following question, turn to the next page, second paragraph. The following question quite naturally comes to mind. If Christ died for all, why then are all not saved? The answer lies in the simple but plain fact that each one must experience a believing faith that Christ died for him before he can participate in the benefits of his death for himself. Okay, that? Uh, page. I don't know, page 192? Okay. Next page. After the, yeah. we were talking about uh, the verses, right? For the entire world. Okay. So 192, the second paragraph. The following question. Let me read again. Please read with me. So that you will remember this concept. The following question quite naturally comes to mind. If Christ died for all, why then are all not saved? The answer lies in the simple but plain fact that each one must experience a believing faith that Christ died for him because he can participate, before he can participate in the benefits of his death for himself. For himself. See? You will be able to benefit. You will be able to receive. You will be able to appropriate healing. You wouldn't need to love money because you will have in your heart this assurance that your father owns a thousand hills and all the cattle on them. You know, I know sometimes I ask, Lord, if you own a thousand hills and you own all these cattle, why don't you kill a couple and send it my way? We need some beef. Where's the beef? And again, it's the issue of faith, right? It's the issue of faith. Who of you right now are dying, basically? Yeah, but well, right now, in about 10 minutes, you will die because you have no food, because you're really cold. You're dying of hypothermia, you're dying of malnutrition. What? Whatever else. That is because of a lack. Sadness. Huh? Yeah. Are you dying because you lack something? No. Some of us will die because we have too much. Yeah. Too much cholesterol, too much fat, high blood pressure. Right? None of us are dying because of lack of things. Here in this room, you're not dying because you lack something. You will die because you have too much. High blood, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, what else? You know, too much uh, preservatives in your food. Okay? That's, that's, that, that our death is not coming from that. It's from excess. Right? If anything, you know, I'm talking in practical terms. I'm not talking in the semantics of living and dying for Jesus Christ. No, I'm talking in terms of, there you are. So you cannot think, tell me that God does not provide for you. Why? Because if you know Jesus Christ, if you have experience with Jesus Christ, if you know who He is, then you can appropriate the benefits of His sacrifice. Let's close with this illustration. These two kids, you know, the two kids, uh, Mary Ann's kids, they're still here. Mary Ann will come back probably Thursday morning. She'll, she'll board something on you know, Wednesday night from Las Vegas and then come back to us Thursday morning. Okay. But you see the privilege that God gave to her. I don't know if you will see this lesson, but you see the privilege of what God gave to her. She's gone for almost three weeks and her children are fine. This morning I said to them, you know, when I came down at this point this afternoon, I said, and be encouraged on ever going home. I said to her, I said to the two kids, do you have food? Well, we don't have a lot, but we have enough. I said, okay, what do you have? I have some macaroni. Okay. So this afternoon we came here and uh, Pellegrino was kind enough to cook some corn. So we all had one corn each. Okay. It's always good. Corn is a good filler. And then after that, I went to their room and 
I said, okay, let me see your refrigerator. What are you talking about? There's no more food because I want to know. So I opened the freezer, and there in that freezer was the same box of food that I left there. I said, it hasn't been opened, the tape's still on. What are you talking about? We did not know there was food there. Why is it there in the freezer then? It's there to remain cold. You know? So I pulled it out, and I opened it, and I said, look, this is quiche. Chorizo flavor. I said, all you have to do is put it in the microwave. You have a case, eight boxes, okay? Eight boxes. So before you complain that you don't have food, and he was like, yeah, that looks good. I said, yeah, but it only looks good because you're, you keep looking at it. <laughs> It'd be good if you tasted it, okay? And so, Randy, I said, you didn't see. The thing is sometimes, we as Christians, we make do without it. Because we do not see well enough. But the truth of the matter is, God is providing for us. Okay? Today, what did God provide for you? God provided you the wherewithal to come here and for three hours sit, and you're going, what's the benefit? Some of you did not understand anything. You, know, you have to go home and study again, right? And some of you maybe understood, but even if you understood, what's the benefit? What is it? You sat here, so you learned for three hours. Learn what? Well, God will be able to knit all these things together and show you exactly what it is all about. Do we believe that God knows what He's doing? Yes. So offer God thanks that you were able to sacrifice three hours to study. Some of you were already questioning even before you got into this process. Where's the resources? How am I going to pay? How am I going to come? Will I be able to come? Will I have the motivation? Yeah. Some students, they will quit. The question is, God is giving you this wherewithal to do these things. Do you appreciate it? Don't take it for granted. Okay? Alright, let's close with prayer. Lord, we ask that you will give us traveling mercy as we go home. Give us rest, Lord, that we may come back tomorrow with strength to finish the second week.